Okay, welcome to the last session of this day. I'm happy to introduce Richard Fairhurst and Sarah Hoffman for a talk on the vagaries of OSM tagging. Tagging has already been touched upon in a couple of ta talks today um, about how what you map or what you think you might get from the data isn't always what was intended or what you were hoping to get. Someone's competing with me out there. Um, so Richard, Richard is working on cycle.travel, which is a, a platform that lets you plan uh, proper cycle routes. And he's more than once um, been disappointed by OpenStreetMap data by assuming, simply assuming that it'll probably give you a smooth, smooth ride when you go along a resi residential road in the US or something, and then being told, wait a minute, that's maybe not a good approach. So he's probably ha he has lots of experience in how data needs to be interpreted. And Zara is maintaining the nominatum geocoder that you are all using when you type something in the search box in OpenStreetMap. And She's basically the person who has to answer all those, why is this address not found? Or why does this house show up as belonging to city A when in fact it is part of city B or something? Uh, and then she either has to fix the tagging or her software or tell the person to get lost. So without further ado, um, here's Richard and Sarah with their talk. Yes, so this is talking about data. So let me start with the first map I made of OSM data, which is from 2009, when I started mapping railways in Switzerland, which is really fun. You have an excuse to just ride a train all day. Um, so what you see there in the map is basically you see some roads, you see waterways, some place names. And in 2009, this was pretty much all the data you have. So if you made a map, you made it from all the OSM data. The same place today uh, in ID. Well, we're not surprised to see all the buildings mapped, all the addresses in there. But if you look at the trains, which I was starting to uh, map in 2009, you see not only are there all tracks there, but even the uh, poles of the electric lines is mapped in the data. And of course, this data, uh, you can't put it all on a map anymore. So that's what we're going to look at now. We're going to see both how do data users see the OpenStreetMap data? How do we, as people like me and Sarah, who are consuming this data, actually make any use of it? And also, from the point of view of individual contributors, what can you do to make sure that your data is actually used in the map? Because that's why we do it. Uh, we contribute to OpenStreetMap because we want our data to be used. We don't just want to be mapping into a void of some sort. So we're going to explore the relationship between mappers and data users and how sometimes it works and uh, sometimes it's a bit more complicated than that. Ah. <laughs> okay, so a little bit about us. Uh, oh, sorry. A little bit about us. Uh, Frederick has said it almost all. So I'm a long-time computer. Did my first edit in 2008. Then in 2009, I started with the map you just saw. Um, when I was done with the railways, uh, I thought the hiking trails are a good next step. So I started to make another map, which is Waymark Trails. And this went on like this. And in 2012, uh, yeah, there was too much beer at the Stammtisch in Zurich. And somebody suggested, well, I could take over the uh, geocoding server, which I did. And from there on, it was more and more development in OSM. Uh, so nowadays, I'm a full-time developer uh, doing stuff there. So today, I want to speak uh, from the experience of Nominatum. So as you said, this is the software which is behind this little box where you search. Um, so Nominatum was always uh, developed in mind with, OK, you as the mappers, you put some data in, and then you want to find it. Um, so it's meant to be always the newest data. It's meant to be working in all the languages. And 
it's an interesting challenge uh, for the old Zen data because you have to find addresses and addresses are really, really different around the world. So I'm looking a lot into places and boundaries and what the heck they are and what they mean. And the interesting thing about Nominatum is that it's one of the software um, where actually Mapper changed their mapping in order to get data in. So this, uh, when looking into how to use the OSM data was always an important part for me that I do not too much special things because whatever Nominatum does with little tweaks and everything, everybody else, every other data user has to do as well. So this is a little bit my, have been, has been my take in uh, developing Nominatum. And this is me, I'm Richard. Uh, you probably saw me first thing this morning. Uh, I've been involved in OpenStreetMap since um, one of the, uh, the first year, October 2004, which I think is about two months after Steve first started OSM. Um, I wrote Potlatch, which uh, is an editor, uh, originally online editor, has managed to survive many years without somehow ever being banned, although might have sailed close to the wind once or twice. Uh, I've done various other things with OpenStreetMap over the years. Um, and the main perspective I'm gonna come from today is of the cycle routing site that I run, which is cycle.travel, and you should go and have a play with it. Um, and cycle.travel actually takes completely the opposite approach to what Sarah has been just um, describing, in that it looks into absolutely every single possible tagging combination that I can find, and rather than uh, people changing their tagging to adapt to it, I tend to write lots of custom code for weird uh, tag combinations I found, because I want to give its users the best possible cycle routes from A to B that they can. I want someone to be able to type in that uh, they will get from uh, no, New York to San Francisco, and to get a route which does not involve dying of dysentery somewhere along the way, uh, which is a bit of a challenge sometimes. Um, so at the moment, it's a website, cycle.travel, that's the URL. Um, it's based on OSRM, which is a um, very well-known routing engine, but very heavily forked version. There's probably about two to 3,000 lines of code in there just looking at tags and stuff like that. Uh, it, it's a website now, as I say, but there is an iPhone app which is in beta testing. So let's start with how data users approach OSM data. Oh. Okay, so a, a lot of the sort of OSM editing experience, certainly for the first time user, is that you think you go to this editor, you do click, 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 I have just added a road or I've added a point of interest or something like that, and it appears on the view tab. So people's first experience of OSM is the editing ID and it appears in what we as mappers called OSM Carto uh, and it's those two things. Actually you find it is of course much more complex than that and that the data goes into a million and one different places. It goes into search like Nominatum, it goes into routing like cycle travel, it goes into GIS statistics analysis. Um, some of the posters you will see around the uh, coffee room are some of the interesting uses that people have made. You can add 20 search um, filters, you can add lots and lots of different routing engines, you can add hundreds of different maps to that, and they all take data out in sometimes different ways, and that's what we're going to examine today. Yeah, if you have been following Brendan's talk this morning, you know that data users, when they come to OSM, they expect very neat data. They come from the GIS world, so they want uh, points, they want lines, they want their polygons, and attributes are nice, but please, it should be a defined set and not some uh, yeah, mess. And what you get in OSM is this. So there are nodes, ways, relations. Uh, I have plenty of people who come to PyOsmium, which is a Python tool for working with OSM data, and ask, where are the lines? How hard can it be? And similar with our keys and values. So as they are not defined, um, people really don't know what to do with them. So we had a lot of questions on the, on the forums uh, where people said, oh, I've just extracted all the addresses from Italy, and, but somehow they're wrong, they're incomplete. And then people say, yeah, well, you have to first transform OSM with Nominatim into a huge database, and then you can get your addresses. So what a lot of people end up doing is using nice predefined tools that already do this for you. So um, the uh, canonical example is, of course, the OpenStreetMap Carto standard style, the one you see as the default on OpenStreetMap.org, and lots and lots of sites just use the tiles from that, or they use their own um, setup of that, their own server, which is running the same style. Uh, and so if you use that, 
all of these decisions are made for you. You do not need to understand tax. You do not understand. Uh, you do not need to understand how to cope with relations, all of that sort of thing, because the OSM Carto guys have done it for you. Or there are products, sort of um, saleable versions of OSM sometimes, which uh, have done all this pre-processing work. So open map tiles is a particular way of slicing and dicing OSM raw data. Uh, Mapbox have their Mapbox street schema, that sort of thing. Um, the same happens not just in um, cartographic world, in tiles, but also in routing. So I would estimate that the majority of people who are doing routing will just get OSRM or graph hopper and use one of the standard uh, sets of profiles they're sometimes called standard weightings that are um, shipped with these bits of software. Sometimes they will sort of adjust things slightly so they might get the standard bike profile and adjust some of the surface weightings, but it's not much. Um, same goes for geocoding. Most people will just take Nominatum or Pelias or one of the derivatives like Photon and just use the standard stuff there. So there is a reasonably limited appetite for going into OpenStreetMap tagging, doing a deep dive, because it is just really pretty complex. And for most people's needs, the default stuff that you get with these bits of software is enough. So that means we have basically a set of core data in OSM in terms of tagging. And that's uh, so basically some land use stuff like coastlines, uh, natural water, the boundaries are often used. Of course, highways, railways, uh, some amenities, uh, buildings, and addresses. And if you think about it, that's pretty much the map I showed at the beginning of 2009. It's a much more complete, but the set of ta uh, tags which most users use has not changed a lot. And that's an interesting uh, first conclusion because it means these are the tags we really, really have to be careful about. Um, we shouldn't be changing because that is what people rely on. It looks even worse when we talk about secondary tags, so about tags which do not define what the object is, but some properties, some additionals. So yes, name tag, of course, everybody will look, have a look at. If you talk about the names uh, in different languages, it gets a little bit more complicated. And then we come to the access tags, for example. That already gets complicated. Uh, in the UK, for example, um, the open survey, uh, there's a Open Survey Maps, they have an OSM product, and they don't know about access tags. And of course, people complain, and they think OSM is stupid, but we do have the data, but the big data users don't have it. And we're talking here about the simple access, like food, yes, or something that works. If we're talking about the differences between permissive, designated, and official, well, we as mappers don't know really what the difference is, but data users probably won't use it. And if you think about some really additional tags like footwalk so, uh, sidewalk, where you say, OK, this line is not really existing. It's just an additional line to our main street. Forget about it. That's, uh, these pre-processed uh, tools probably won't use it. So much though people using OpenStreetMap data would like it to be, as Brandon alluded earlier, a nice tidy set of columns. It really isn't. Uh, it is this big complex mess of lots and lots of different bits of data. And that means that in order to use it properly, you've got a data mining operation on your hands. You have got to do a lot of assessment of what is it that are the tags that people are actually using? What do they mean? What do they mean in different parts of the world? Because the usage is not always consistent. And that's pretty hard. And one of the problems here is that we don't have a website like Switch to OSM, which explains tagging. So just to explain that, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we noticed that a lot of people were getting interested in hosting OpenStreetMap-based maps. Uh, and that was mostly because Google had put their prices up. So they thought, ah, this, this is a cheap option called OpenStreetMap. Uh, and then they got onto the wiki and they got confused by about 27 different pages, all telling you how to um, set up a OpenStreetMap tagging server for whatever brand of CentOS the person who wrote the uh, wiki page was using at the time. Um, it, it was quite complicated. So we did a nice, easy to use um, how to site called switch to, switch to OSM. That doesn't exist for tags. There is no single easy to use reference on how to use the most common tags. 
And that is challenging because, as we say, for the data consumer, especially those who haven't come from an open street map background, they've maybe come from a traditional GIS background, they do not understand what they're getting here. They expect it to be consistent coverage, they expect it to be tidy, they do not have to un expect to understand a whole new world of tagging, and you do. And that means that it is really, really hard, unless you are an open street map expert, unless you've been coming to these conferences for many years, to understand um, how to pass some of these tags. I, would say slight vested interest that this is a really good business model for people who understand tax uh, because you can get consultancy work explaining it to people but that's probably not healthy for OpenStreetMap uh, and it certainly doesn't help people get their mapping used in the maximum number of places. Okay so let's look um, how we actually do it when we try to find new tags. So for me the first uh, way to go is always tag info. So tag info, that's the site where you can see which tags are used where. Uh, Geofabric even has this nice little site where you can see it per country. And this shows you the actual use of the tags. That's nice. Problem is, of course, it doesn't explain mean, uh, meaning. So when you search for something, you start searching for terms which might be the same thing uh, you're looking for and then look how they are used. Uh, is it used in only one country? So that's useful. Problem with tech info, the other problem is um, you can see how much it is used, but imports uh, are a problem there because if there's one huge import, importing 100,000 weird text, you suddenly think, well, that's all used uh, and I should be using this. Um, so this is the first thing to do. You know? Yeah, I mean, just an example of how I find tag info to be really useful. One of the things I do with Cycle Travel is um, pass surface values because I want people to be rooted on as nice and smooth a cycle track as it's possible to be. Um, so tag info tells me what surface values people are using and they can be quite creative you know um, it turns out that crushed limestone is a really popular value in the states I hadn't taken account of that but by going to tag info I can see that there are how many thousand values of uh, uses of crushed limestone in the states therefore I ought to be uh, supporting it that sort of thing. It doesn't tell me whether crushed limestone is good or bad but it tells me that people are using it. The second step then is generally going to the OSM wiki and see what is explained there. And it helps, uh, at least if there's some page, even if you're doing a small new tag, if you have just the line there, so a little bit known how it's going. Of course, the problem with the wiki is there's a lot of pages and you never know, is it just one person who did a little bit of uh, digging there and uh, writing there or maybe wanting to get their tag into, the, into OSM? But it's a good way, at least getting an explanation. Okay, so the next part uh, are discussion forums, which you can follow. The problem is there are a lot of them. Um, the tech info list is probably one which might be good to follow, just you don't need to read everything, right? Um, that's astonishingly few people know this. So, um, you can just follow the threads you think are interesting for you, well, cycling, for example, or uh, boundaries for me or addresses, and then see what's going on there. Uh, the nice thing is also local information. You actually need local um, mailing lists, but there you need to uh, talk the language, which is a problem. Yeah, and I would just emphasize that you really do not need to read the entirety of the tagging mailing list. I'm the moderator of the tagging mailing list, and even I don't read all of it. Um, editor presets are also really, really significant because ultimately um, most data in OpenStreetMap comes in via an editor. And most people will choose one of the presets that are there because that has a sort of stamp of approval with it. Um, so if ID, for example, decides to offer a particular set of surface values, then people will correl their contributions into that. Um, that. That is a good way to get started. They are in theory machine readable, but it doesn't always work out like that. The, well, the problem is they're only machine readable. So if you have the file uh, going through as a human is again complicated. Yeah. And I want to add one last uh, source, at least for me, which is Wikipedia, because in the end, if you have local tagging, which uh, has a lot of local knowledge internally inside and which is not explained in the in our wiki 
you end up reading wiki data uh, for things so i have learned a lot about government structures uh, in different countries which are really weird and yeah politics um and so yeah you go to wikipedia read what this weird construction is and then build it into your data Okay, so we have done lots of reading. We have um, absolutely buried ourselves in the OpenStreetMap wiki. Uh, we have read all the mailing lists. It should all be plain sailing from now on. Of course, it would be nice if life was that simple. One of the challenges we have is that the meaning of tags does change a lot over time, that maybe how people are using a tag now isn't how they were using it five, 10 years ago. A uh, Couple of good examples of this. The wiki pages just drift. Someone sees something on the wiki page and thinks, oh, that's not quite right. So they go and change it. All of a sudden, a tag now means something different to what it did beforehand. Um, so when the wiki was first started, someone wrote highway equals cycleway. This is somewhere where you can cycle. And then a few years later, someone changed it to mean it is a way that is solely or predominantly for bikes. Now that's quite different because all of a sudden, couple, after a couple of years, you have now blurred the meaning of can someone walk or not on this. And yeah, you now can't tell that unless you go through the history of the wiki page. Another example is barriers. Um, uh, barrier equals yes. At some point, someone made a very well-meaning change. Uh, I can't fault them for being well-meaning that said that the default for a barrier uh, is that there's no access through it, that it is closed. And if the, um, unless you see an access tag on top of this that says, yes, you can go through it, then um, that means it's closed. Now, that might make sense if it's a wall. By definition, you can't go through a wall unless you're a superhero. Um, but it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense for style, uh, where the whole point of a style is that you can go over it. And this, this just happened, uh, and people sort of noticed another three or four years later, and it turned out that some data consumers were taking it one way, and some data consumers were taking it another way, and we were in an enormous mess. You then have an extra fun dimension to that, which is translations, uh, because people tend to use the wiki in their own native language a lot of the time. So you may find that the documentation changes in one language, for example, in the German translation or German original sometimes, uh, and not in the English translation or the French translation or whatever it might be. Uh, and you know, if, if we're now getting to the point where we're telling people that they've got to read the history of each wiki page and then in each different language, that's kind of impractical. Yes, so for me, usually with Nominatem is uh, I notice things break. People write issues and you look into the wiki page and think, oh, well, that has changed. And I think for most data users, this is the same. So we don't really have uh, any source where we really can follow changes. All the things we have, uh, the wiki change tracking, the mailing lists, um, or, well, editor presses, you can follow the issues there, but they're all too high volume to really follow. So if you're a data user, this is a full-time job. This is really, you need one person who just looks what's going on in OSM, goes to the conferences and so on. So let's have an example how we do this uh, with regional differences. So I'm starting with an example which is probably well known to most of you, um, highway secondary, which if you're coming from somewhere middle Europe, you think, oh yeah, that's the road like this over here where you can go 100 kilometers an hour, no problem. And then you come to Africa and highway secondary is this. And the good thing is, as mappers, we have realized that we have discussed for, I think, six, six, seven, eight years, and then realized, okay, our highway tagging is actually about connectivity between cities, and it's not about the state. And this is documented in the wiki. So there we're really in a good state. Um, this is how it should be done, but as a data user, you have to have a look at what are the implicit uh, defaults which uh, go with our tagging. This is slightly more complex. Uh, this is two tracks, uh, highway equals track. One of them is in uh, Britain, the one on the left. Uh, one of them is in Germany, the one on the right. Now, I'm not actually talking so much about the physical aspect here. They, I mean, they look like slightly different, but that's fine. You can express that in track type or surface or whatever it might be. Um, the cr crucial difference here is that if you look on the one on the left, there's a little notice on that gate and it says private woods keep out. And it turns out that the British OpenStreetMap community 
does not expect that a highway equals track will necessarily be um, open to the public. In fact, it probably isn't. Whereas the German speaking communities, it's much more expected that highway equals track will be somewhere of um, public access. And that can be, that's not really written down anywhere, or if it is, it's sort of hidden about five wiki pages deep in a complex table that might or might not include highway equals track. And so that's the kind of knowledge, first of all, as a data consumer, you've got to write some special code to cope with that, but you've also got to know that you've got to cope with that in the first place. If you don't, what happens, uh, and this is not a theoretical example, what happens is that you might write a cycle routing engine that behaves one way or the other, uh, then people start getting routed along private tracks, the farmer gets cross, the farmer emails OpenStreetMaps Data Working Group, and the Data Working Group volunteers all of a sudden have another problem to deal with. So, you also find that there are quite a lot of tags that are used predominantly or start off certainly being used in one country. So in Germany, and this is actually a good tag, I'm fully in support of this, but Germany, they had a need for a bit more nuance in the highway classification. Uh, so instead of inventing a whole new highway tag, which would be problematic, um, they refined highway equals trunk by saying, this is not just a trunk road, this is a motor road. And that has all sorts of extra implications about uh, access. And that's good, that's a nice, simple tag. It's well documented, you can, you can understand it, and it degrades gracefully. If you don't pass that tag, not that many bad things are going to happen, to be honest. Um, in the UK, we have a particular legal framework about paths and cycleways and bridleways and things like that, we, um, called public rights of way. And we record that using the designation tag. That's a little bit more complex, but again, it should degrade fairly gracefully because it's an addition to the existing tagging. And that is something that it's good if you can pass. It's not the end of the world if you can't. Australia, they had a four-wheel drive only equals yes tag because a lot of their roads are um, only super four-wheel drive cars. Slightly more problematic because that's effectively a value judgment. Um, whether it's four-wheel drive only or not probably depends on how carefree you are with your chassis, but, you know, um, not necessarily a bad thing. New England, this one I really struggle with. If you look over the uh, northeast of the states, there's a lot of things tagged highway equals path, snowmobile, snowmobile equals yes. And I look at these and I cannot see for the life of me how they qualify as a path because they're mostly through forests or across lakes or something like that. That breaks. If you see something that says highway equals path, snowmobile equals yes, and your um, routing engine doesn't know about snowmobile equals yes, then all of a sudden you have just routed a walker across a lake uh, at the times that it isn't frozen. Yes, and another interesting problem we have is that in OSM we often, or not often, but sometimes allow that really the function follows the name. I think the most uh, famous example here is MNMP Cafe. So if you go in France into something that's called cafe, you generally get something that's like a bistro. So you can get a light meal, you get wine, you get beer, whatever. If you go in Germany into something called amenity cafe, I expect that I get cake. Very, very sweet, very lots of it. And not necessarily something which gets me for lunch. And this is actually something we want to have because we want, don't want to have the French take a mappers at thousands of texts explaining, yeah, you can have lunch here, maybe pizza, whatever, because everybody in France knows what a cafe is. And we don't, uh, we are not very good at, again, documenting these nuances. So writing this out, I found that we now have this cuisine, which actually does it very well. But as a data user, of course, you have to find out what is the uh, default in which country, if you want to use this. You also find that people have different interpretations with sort of hierarchical tags, the scale type tags. Uh, and this is an example of Britain versus France. Uh, believe it or not, those are both at the same zoom level. Those are both zoom level seven, rendering place equals city. Uh, and in Britain, it turns out that we have lots more cities than the French community. And OK, there are certain sort of historical accidents around this. Basically, in Britain, a city is somewhere that the Queen says is a city. And that can be something that only has popular of 5,000 people. I'm not making that up. There are places that are that small that are officially cities. But, you know, conversely, there are places I would look at 
for France and say, you know, I would expect that to be a city. I would expect on that map to see Le Puy en Valais or something like that, which I would have thought would be um, a city for its regional uh, significance. It isn't, and that's 100% cool. That's the uh, judgment call that the French community have made. But it does mean that if you want your map to look vaguely consistent, and I'm fully aware that mine doesn't, um, then you're going to have to do some extra processing over and above just looking at the tags to cope with the density differences that you see. So let's look at this again from the mapping side. So what can we do to make the data better? What should be avoided? So the first thing I want to talk about are catch-all primary tags. So primary tags, again, are the ones which define what an object is. And I think the most famous for me example here is tourism information. I think it started live as what we see on the left is the information office. And then somebody thought, oh, a map, that's also tourism information. Let's add this too. And oh, guidepost, well, yeah, information, isn't it? And I see we now have audio guides even, and yeah, trailblazers. So this is a little bit the riddle. Uh, find the common uh, denominator in these five uh, pictures. And this is a problem because I stumbled upon this uh, with nominatum. You can, in nominatum, you can search for certain types of objects. And this only works for primary objects. So you could, in theory, say, I want to have a guidepost in uh, Florence. I don't know if there are any here. But, and this doesn't work because Nominatum only stores that this is a tourism information. The good thing about tourism uh, information is that we actually could get rid of the stack. Uh, information isn't used anywhere else. So right now, we could make information a primary tag and just be done with this problem. This feature creep gets more complicated with others. And Richard has already talked a little bit about highway paths. And these are examples from the wiki. And I also found a snowmobile uh, example when doing, uh, preparing this talk. I have no idea what it's doing here, there because snowmobiles have two tracks, not one. So it's not a path, not in our definition. And the problem is this can get really, really dangerous. So we have paths like the one on the uh, on the other side there, which has a SAC scale, um, difficult alpine hiking, and you do not want to uh, put your users on this tag. So if you do not know about SAC scale and just do a map, you might kill your users. So everyone here has probably heard the phrase, don't tag for the renderer. This is sort of one of the fundamental tenets of OpenStreetMap. It's also the most widely misunderstood uh, tenet of OpenStreetMap. This is what don't tag for the renderer means. It means do not mistag stuff. Do not say that I want this to appear on the map in blue, So, because it really is blue. Uh, so I'm going to tag it as natural equals water. Do not say that I want my golf course um, sand areas to appear in a nice yellow. So I'm going to tag them as beaches. Yeah, that probably does look yellow on OpenStreetMap Carto or whatever map style you're using. Uh, but it also means that when someone builds a lovely application to say, find your nearest beach near you, uh, then you end up with a load of um, day trippers uh, camping out on your golf course. Uh, but you should be aware of the renderer. You should be aware of the router and the search engine and all of these things and the basically the code that is going to be using your data. Um, it is not a sensible thing just to say, oh, well, I'm going to map what the hell I like and it's up for the uh, renderers and the routers to sort it out. The renderers and the routers are written by hard pressed people like um, me and Sarah who would love to spend our days writing 500 more use case, uh, 500 more cases for um, new exciting path definitions that people have come up with. But fortunately, we actually have some uh, uh, proper work to do, so we can't. So there should be a sort of two-way relationship between the mapper and the um, and the data consumer, rather than just assuming that the data consumer will cope with whatever the mapper feels like doing this week. Yeah. So. Another example of, please, uh, this is not an excuse to uh, do not tag for the renderer, are these huge multi-polygons. And interestingly, this is a, a bay, and it is an example of mapping for the renderer, because why people did start doing this is they want to have a label in the middle of this little bay, and 
Cato wasn't uh, labeling points, it was only labeling polygons. So people started creating these 4,000 member polygons, which regularly kill, I think, Richard's uh, import process. Um, so yeah, this is really thinking a little bit about, okay, not being too complex helps getting your data used. Now, yeah. When you are developing new tagging schemes, I know that's not something everyone does, but there's a lot of people who spend their um, free time on the wiki or on the tagging mailing list or something thinking of new things to tag. Um, then we, as a general rule, we optimize for the mapper and we optimize for the average mapper because that mappers are our most valuable resource. We want more mappers. We do not want things to be too complex for the mappers. So it is a good rule in any tagging scheme to have meaningful tags where complexity is something you add on rather than having to bake in complexity from day one. So this is an example of a tag that I find, or a set of tags that I find um, somewhat challenging. Uh, there's been a great project in the UK to map solar panels. This is good. Uh, solar panels are kind of a thing we need in the modern world uh, before we all get engulfed in a ball of flames. Uh, so it's really good to have this mapped. However, the approved way of tagging solar panels is with these six tags. I mean, that's a heck of a lot of tags for one little thing on someone's roof. And even then, there's a lot of redundancy in there. So, you know, power equals generator. Well, I mean, I guess, yeah. Uh, location equals roof. Well, you're welcome to try putting a solar panel in the basement. I don't think it will work so well. Uh, generator type solar photo, solar photo, photovoltaic panel. I can't even say it. Uh, generator source equals solar. Well, we just had solar up there. Do we need that again? Generator method equals photovoltaic. We just had that again as well. Generator output electricity equals yes, I guess. So. I mean, you could just say generator equals solar panel, and that would do all of those things, or power equals solar panel, something along those lines. You do not have to have all of this complexity. Uh, that, that makes it harder for data users to pass, and it makes it harder for people to enter as well. And of course, the most famous example when it comes to complexity is our public transport mapping. <laughs> and I see Andy crying. Um, so yeah, this is the wiki page for it, and it's not the problem is not that it is complex or that it allows you to map complex situations. The problem is it only uh, caters for complex situation, one has the uh, impression. So it gives you lots of possibility to map the most crazy situations. Um, and what it ends up is this, for example. So I just took a little uh, situation in Dresden. This is a tram stop. Uh, Incidentally, there are three on the map here, so that's really, I think, um, 500 meters apart or something like this. And you have a platform mapped as an area. You have a platform mapped as a way, and you have it as a node. So if you want to really use this data, you have to understand everything about this, uh, this schema. You can't really start with the simple part. And we did have a more simple way of mapping um, public transport. And the schema meant to fix it, and it also said, oh, you can keep using the old one, but it never said how. So now you can't really use any of those. So you can't use the simple one because uh, you see it here, you get lots of duplicates with the, uh, with the tram stops and stuff like this. And yeah, you can use the complex one, but then you really, really have to do a lot of development. And finally, after uh, complaining a lot, Let's have a look at a good example where we have complexity, which is really solved well. And that's the uh, simple 3D uh, building model. So if you don't care about 3D buildings, you don't care about them. You just map your building with building yes, and you're done with it. And if there's a 3D renderer, it will do something with it. It even looks uh, OK. And then you say, hmm, this looks nice, what this renderer is doing. I will try a little bit. And you can start with adding text. You can say, oh, I have this roof shape, or my building is this height, and you can say meters, or you can say just levels if you don't want to measure with your uh, laser measurement or whatever. And you get a little bit of better rendering. And you still don't bother the people who don't care about uh, 3D mapping. Or you say, I go all the way in. I want to have relations. I want to have thousands of building parts. I want to have uh, arcs and whatever. You can do this as well. So here we have a church, nicely mapped. 3D renderer will make something out of it. And the people who still don't care about 3D rendering, 
they won't touch the church probably but it doesn't matter because it's confined and the building next uh, door they can map as they want to and also uh, the 3d uh, simple model says you always have to have the simple building equals this or building equals whatever so if as a data user i don't want to understand this either i still have the church in my data and it's not like i have to know anything about this so this is really a way of consecutively becoming more and more complex. Uh, it's good for the mappers, it's good for the data users. So if you find yourself in the situation where you think there is something not being represented in OpenStreetMap at all and you want to come up with some tags for it, go through this list. First of all, does your tagging discourage new mappers, and I really do mean new mappers, from editing? Is this going to be something that um, is has a, a big sign all over it saying abandon hope or ye who enter here? Or is it something that someone who has the same interest as you can get started with mapping? Is it consistent with the way we do things in OpenStreetMap? And I, I look at probably you know, a bunch of the proposals that go past on um, the tagging mailing list or on the wiki or whatever, and I'd say you know, probably 20% of them just are not how tags in OpenStreetMap traditionally work. Uh, they might have too much of a value judgment in them, for example, or they might expect too much of the user. Is there a reasonable chance to keep the data up to date? Are you putting such a burden on people that they're never going to be able to correct a little thing that has gone wrong without going back to a big, long uh, reference manual as to how the tags work? Does your tagging need external tool support? This is a big thing because people get used to the fact that a lot of the key tools use things like OSM to PG SQL, which takes OpenStreetMap data and puts it in a post, uh, post database, uh, and that copes with certain things. If someone else is doing interesting things with, open, uh, with OpenStreetMap data, but maybe with a different tool set, are they going to have a problem because the particular transformations they need to make sense of your data aren't available in that language or in, in that environment? So, you know, that's a challenge for things like opening hours, for example. Opening hours are really complex to pass. There are about you know, three or four different implementations for three or four different languages. If someone is writing something in a different language, then all of a sudden their barrier to writing this new cool thing they want to do starts with, I've got to write a new opening hours parser. So all in all, will your tagging make it easier or harder for people to use OpenStreetMap in creative, productive or unexpected ways, which is our mission statement as of the first page of the wiki? Okay, um, so <laughs> uh, how, how should you do things? Um, it is good for things to degrade gracefully. It is good to add detail rather than expecting that to be practical. So a really good example is highway equals trunk with motor road equals yes. Um, it's not the end of the world if you don't understand motor road equals yes. It's a nuance on top of highway equals trunk. That's good. Uh, motor road equals yes is well-defined, well-documented. Uh, it is supported widely by the community. This is all good stuff. Highway equals footway, footway equals sidewalk. This is more problematic because, as Sarah explained, is that really a footway? Is it part of the main road carriageway? It's a difficult one to pass. And, uh, you know, there are possibly different ways that we could have come up with of mapping sidewalks that would have worked better. Do not just gratuitously change tags because it looks tidier. Um, so, for example, changing the phone tag to contact colon phone helps absolutely no one apart from making a load of tags, uh, a load of data consumers instantly obsolete. Uh, waterway equals riverbank has now been changed to, uh, is it natural equals water, water equals river or something like that, which is harder to pass. Um, it means that you know, you've now got to look two levels deep to find out what particular thing this is and so on. And, you know, don't don't just come up with um, tacking schemes that might look nice and tidy in a tree form because you think that's going to be helpful for data consumers. Uh, at least don't do that without talking to some data consumers because it turns out that, you know, we all have to use a lot of different lookup tables. Having to have both phone and contact colon phone in there is not a problem at all. Um, as we say, it is a data mining expedition. Um, do, not, do not come up with new tacking schemes because you think they look tidy. Yeah, and finally, um, you already said this, uh, you also have to think about what we can process or what data users can process. So what really works well is uh, converting OSM data into the simple feature model, model, creating points, lines, polygons that we know how to do. 
Um, also filtering tags, I think there's quite a bit of uh, tool support around. So uh, we had an example for different heights. Uh, this is something that's doable. Um, as long as it's only one tag, you can expect this from data users. Where it works less well is uh, with our relations. Um, so probably term restriction is something uh, routers have to do at the moment. Um, there's a couple of software around uh, that can pass routes, but it's starting to get a little bit special. And yeah, anything beyond that with relations we have, there are very few users who use this. Um, and this uh, goes a bit into the second point that most of the tool chains are still uh, focused on processing one app object. So if you have multiple objects in there, like for lanes, when you have different uh, lanes going in parallel, we are really getting into trouble. Um, also, as we said, data with different interpretations in an area. So if your data needs uh, to know in which country it is, we still don't really have a decent uh, tool support for this. And this is, might be something we have to change on the tooling side, but of course, to make really use of this, we need the documentation. And on which was the request, I added also the list of values, so semicolon lists, which have become a little bit of a standard. And yes, that's true that they are still not supported by tools, but I think that's the fault of the tools too. <laughs> yeah, so with all these tools, the question is, do we need new primitives? Um, we have complex uh, tagging schemes uh, that we want to process. I think the lane tagging um, from the parallel loads. We have the indoor tagging, which we still, there we have layers uh, of different data directly on top of each other, which uh, really gets difficult to handle with editors and also with uh, data users alike. Um, I've added here also sites, so something like a university. Um, it should be something we should be able to somehow handle, but maybe there also we need uh, more standards. Um, do you want to say something about the centerline model? Yeah, the centerline problem is quite an interesting one because um, essentially we started tagging things a few years ago as this road has got three lanes or this road has got four lanes. Uh, and then we started saying, well, maybe this lane is a bike lane and this lane is a bus lane and that sort of thing. And what you end up doing is um, uh, mapping lots and lots of different attributes with these sort of little sub tags and it gets almost as if there's a whole sub language being in, invented here um, that is problematic my particular challenge with that is that all of a sudden you might see a cycleway branches off this center line because a cycleway has started and how that's mapped well the center line and then there's a 45 degree bend that goes into a cycleway so my router will say take a sharp left into the cycleway it's not it just carries on but because we map things as center lines uh, then we've got this limitation and that is something that uh, we have not yet adequately solved either by tags or by the data model yes so this is something we need to solve uh, commonly so i uh, refer to uh, Jochen's talk, which talked a little bit, bit more about the data model. Um, we see what we can do there. And yeah, then we are open for questions. And before, you know, I, I think one thing about this talk is that, you know, to a certain extent, we've just had, we've just subjected you to 50 minutes of here are some problems and here are some more problems. It is absolutely fantastic that people want to map so much detail. It is absolutely fantastic that people are so enthusiastic about mapping a million and one different things. And that should be encouraged. What I would like to see is that all of that detail that people are mapping is something that can be used, that this can get out into the million and one maps out there. Um, Sarah and I take a lot of effort and put a lot of thought into using the tags. Not necessarily everyone does. We would love to see your work be more widely used. Thank you for that. Predictably, people at home and in the auditorium are panicking. What, can I not simply use that highway equals track in the UK? Um, or highway equals path. Um, <clears throat> one, I have, have to conflate these questions a little because otherwise it will take too long. But a, a frequent question is, all that special knowledge that you mentioned, like, oh, you have to interpret these things differently in different countries. A, 
Where is this documented? And B, uh, if it isn't, could the OSMF or the local chapters maybe help creating that documentation and making it easier for users to draw the right conclusions from the data? It would be absolutely terrific if someone were to take on the task of doing something like switch to OSM for tagging for a curated documentation site, because the wiki is terrific in lots of different ways, but because the wiki is collaborative and everyone could put their own hobby horse in, the uh, documentation has grown like topsy and it's difficult to find stuff. If someone were to do a curated documentation site, that would be the best thing ever. Do you see how the like OSMF or local chapters could somehow do that in a sort of you know organized way, kickstart that in, in any meaningful way, or is it just yeah, we're waiting for someone to pick it up? <laughs> it might be possible. I, I mean we have a maintainer now for ID, so having a maintainer who looks through the stuff really in a in a development lay, like you have a GitHub thingy where people can have pull requests. And then they're looking, is this reasonable or not? In a way, we are already doing this. The editor developers are already doing this. So people just want to get their things in there, and they get tons and tons of issues, and they have to look, OK, what's really used? And does it make sense? So yeah, it's, it's a full job. So maybe it's something the OSMF could support. Do you think that it could also be an, an issue of a translation in that some tag documentation is only available in certain languages? Yeah, uh, I mean, that is very much a live problem as it is. Um, I have a thing that sometimes I will look to see a particular type of cycleway tagging in Germany or something. I, I To my uh, shame, I don't speak German. But what I, what I tend to do, actually, uh, is that I look at the German page and you can usually pick out a particular noun that keeps appearing. What you do is you take that noun and you put it into Google image search and that shows you a load of pictures of it. And you think, oh, that's what it is. So, yeah. Some uh, people online and or in the audience, I, I can't see where the questions come from, are making the tag proposal uh, process responsible for the mess. Uh, do you think there is some truth in that? And do you have any ideas about, or could the tag proposal and tag establishment process in OSM be changed as to reduce these problems? <laughs> So uh, someone likes asking the uh, uh, easy questions here, don't they? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, the the tag proposal process has a whole bunch of problems with it. And, you know, what one of the problems is basically that you can get 10, 15 people to vote on something. Those 10 to 15 people do not necessarily have to have any knowledge of the subject in question. They don't even necessarily have to be real people. It's amazing how suddenly these new users who you've never heard of before say, oh, yeah, uh, I think this is great. I think this is great. I think this is not at all suspicious in the slightest. Um, but how you get past that, I don't know. Um, I, I really don't know. I mean, you can look at how things evolve organically. You can see how things are being used on the map and say when it's got to a certain level, that's great. But uh, I, yeah, that's not an easy one to answer. So uh, I've watched this a little bit. So the voting itself of the tagging process, I think, yeah, we can scrap that. That's, that's weird. Um, but I think the good thing about the whole tech proposal process is that it forces people to go on the mailing list and discuss their stuff. And if you follow a little bit the tagging mailing list and ignore the long-winded discussion, you see that really people come and say, ah, you haven't looked into this aspect of the tagging. And yeah, there is this problem. You're broadening a tag on something. So the things we have talked about today, people on the tagging mailing list are aware of these. And they look after new tags and try to avoid these er errors. So I think the discussion part of the proposal process is already good. And maybe we have to find something else for the voting. OK, are there any questions in the audience? There are a few more online, but I want to give the audience a chance to. Hi, thank you very much for explaining all that. I think it's, uh, it was very necessary. Um, I think that one of the solutions could be to use very more uh, like the data items. So data items will be a structured way to describe um, the tags. And I think that the wiki itself is a problem because of the translations, because of everything that you discussed. And I think that um, all the info box, for example, 
uh, it should come directly from the, the main data source for all the translations, for example. That will solve one issue. The, the second issue is that how do we track in time the evolution of the status of the, of the, of the tags? And having a structured database to describe it is the way to solve it. And I think that uh, we should not um, like um, uh, consider the wiki as the final solution because it, it, it has been the media wiki uh, software has been made to build an encyclopedia. And here we are trying to, to, to build documentation. And I think we, we need, we really need more structured data to achieve that. And the last thing is that um, with this metadata uh, um, describing the tags, we could build a bunch of uh, metadata describing the, the local um, specificities. You mentioned uh, how a cafe uh, is implicitly uh, described in France or in Germany or um, a track in Germany and in England. And I guess it could be described. It could be described in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, specific way. And I think the data item is the right place to do it. And I think the, this new layer or explanation of what a tag is, how to, to track the evolution in time of, of the explanation of, of this tag, I think we could do it in the data items. And um, I think uh, it could be done collabor collaboratively. Uh, yeah. So you didn't want to ask a question, you just wanted to. No, no the, the question is, that, uh, two, two minutes ago, you said, um, I think we should, someone should create a, met, a website to explain uh, the, the, web, the, the, the tags. I think here we have the solution. And what do you think of this solution? I think that's an interesting idea. Um, I, I would have to look into it some more. I, I like the idea, certainly, of um, you know m making things less uh, ambiguous in cases, and I can see that that would really help with that. Uh, I, I would need to look into that further, but you know, po post something somewhere. That that does sound interesting. Okay, we have to close the questions now. There are a few things still unanswered, but yeah, we can't solve all tagging in. 60 minutes. Thank you again, Sarah and Richard.